it's good to be here with you crazy people. Yeah, amen. Amen, you crazy Jesus people. I love it. Hey, man, no place I'd rather be than here. Man, in a, in a place where we can join together. Man, we can worship him. We can let the spirit move in our lives. Ah, oh, that's what we need, amen? How, how we need the Lord. So, yes. And uh, if you would, I, I just want to just kind of remind you guys and, and maybe jot it down in your notepad or whatever, but just to continue to keep Dave in prayer and, and, uh, and lift him up. It's a, it's, you know, it's a heavy, great loss. Um, and even in the midst of the great loss, there's a great hope because we don't wonder where Sherry is. We know by the grace of God, by the blood of the cross, that her sins, which were many, have been made white as snow, and she's in his presence. Same hope we hold on to, right? We are all sinners saved by a great and beautiful grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're thankful for that, but just remember him in your prayers as he's in the midst of it, and you know how that, I mean, how that kind of comes in waves, and you wake up the next morning, and it's okay, and you wake up the next morning, and it's not, and we just keep him in prayer as he goes through this, and I just was really grateful to talk to him this afternoon, and him to say, um, I'm planning on being there Sunday, because I feel like it's what I need to do, and I thought, man, yes, just to be encouraged and uplifted, so, but just keep praying for him. So tonight, um, we're going to be picking up, we're going to go through and continue in the study that we left off with in 2 Samuel. We're going to be picking up in chapter 20 tonight. Um, but from, for my plan tonight, we're going, to, we're going to stop a little bit short and we're just going to pray together Amen. as a church uh, for our nation Amen. and for the things going on and, you know, for even for individual needs in our lives. But I just, I want to pray together as the church. And I know we pray on Sunday night, um, but it's just important. And I think of the words of Jesus. Yes. My house shall be called a house of what? Prayer. 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 Absolutely. And it's something that I just, I, I feel heavy. And, and also, um, I don't know if you guys follow Jack Hibbs at all. I like Jack Hibbs quite a bit. But I, I follow him uh, on social media and he, like three or four days ago, he emailed or mailed, I don't know what he did, but he, he mailed the White House and asked President Trump if he would make Wednesday another national day of prayer. And I, I mean, I'm sure that the, that the White House has a lot of mail, <laughs> all kinds of mail, mail they don't want, mail they do want, all that stuff. But anyways, um, he just called everyone to pray with him. So we're going to pray tonight a little bit, but we're going to start out with our study and the continuation of the craziness of the life of David. I mean, we're in a season, and you guys know very well, it's a continuation of crazy, and it's kind of, it's kind of prophetically, because of his own doing and his own sin, it's kind of his new normal. Crazy It's his new normal. <laughs> I feel like at my house, crazy is always my normal, but anyways... Uh, that's what you get with a three-year-old and then teenagers and a six-year-old in the mix. So it's a whole lot of fun. We were just talking about how Josiah came up the other day and he had peanut butter all over his hands. Where, what, who, when? I'm not going to ask. Let's clean you up. <clears throat> it's about normal. But we're in the midst of this crazy time, and it's not only a crazy time in the life of David. It's a crazy season in the nation of Israel. You know, when I think about it, I think, man, well, we need to hear it. <laughs> we need to hear from it. We're in a, in a crazy, divided time. It's a division that's going on in the nation of Israel at this time, and we're in a crazy, divided time. And, and so I just think, let's, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that you move in our hearts and our lives because we want to represent you well this time. Um, we, want to, we want to represent the hope that we have well in this season of life. Um, so, coming off the heels of, and I'm going to do, it kind of has to, and I apologize <laughs> beforehand, even though somebody told me, when you're speaking, never apologize, too late. I'm apologizing beforehand because we have to catch up 
to where we're at. I mean, we're at this crazy scene, so we got to remember why we're there. And I mean, this stuff, it's good for me when I'm trying to figure out where we're at. So coming in off of this, um, off the heels of Absalom overturning his rule, you guys remember that, and gaining really, Absalom really gained control of most of the nation of Israel um, during that time. Even, even Judah, his tribe, he went there first and kind of got some of David's tribe of Judah um, I mean, which of course was Absalom's tribe as well, but to go. And so Absalom has most everybody except for a few guys. Um, and he's got control over the nation against David. And as David left Israel, as he left Jerusalem and headed out, he had a group, a band of loyal people who were there with him. And this is kind of an interesting note, who were mostly people who were not Hebrew nationals. Not the hot dogs. I know you guys were thinking of the hot dogs. But these guys, his, and, and including his special forces, the guys that were really close to him, that were, he, he had his back and were, were kind of running special ops and secret service and all those things, these guys weren't actually Hebrew people. They weren't actually Israelites, but they were people that we saw from, I think, last week and a couple of weeks ago, totally loyal to David, not of David's nationality, not of his kingdom, but completely 100% loyal to David. And they became people who followed the God of David because of the example of David. Those are some powerful words. Those are some powerful things for us to think about, that people would follow the example of our lives and, and in doing so say, I need to follow the God that this person serves. And just the call is the reality of God. Is it there? Is it real in your life? I'm trying to, I'm trying to, sometimes I fail, but I'm trying to, whenever I talk to somebody and they tell me any of their problems at all, every time pray with them right there. Not let it walk away, but pray with them right there. And what it does is show the reality of God. Man, this guy, there's a reality of God in the life of this guy. And I want all of us to do that. I'm not just saying to me, you might, it might be weird, it might be awkward. You might be standing in Walmart praying one time and think, this is awkward. That's okay. Amen. Do it. Be awkward for the Lord. Um, and, and stand for him, and he will stand for us. So, so of course, we see this, and, and as we looked at last week, the people from the nation of Israel definitely began to and continued to support King David through the battle. People started defecting back to King David, realizing, what am I doing? They started coming back. His numbers increased. And then um, those, those numbers that increased, they went through the battle. So they finally, kind of to make a long story short, they had the battle, David's army versus Absalom's army. They, did it in the, they had the battle in the forest, not out on a battlefield. And David's men, their army won. Um, and Absalom was killed. You guys remember, Absalom got hung in a tree, and and um, and David's. Remember, David's commander Joab was the one that came and stuck three spears in his belly, according to the scripture there. Um, but Joab, he 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 killed him. But if you remember, David previously had commanded all of the armies of Israel not to touch Absalom, right? So. And, and we had that kind of awkward scene where Joab, we believe, against the word of the king, which wasn't his place to do, killed his son. But still, it's a really difficult thing because Joab seems to be so loyal to David. And he's doing it for David's good, if you guys remember. So he, he, he kind of has that mentality that if Absalom comes back one day, he's going to still kill David. He's going to overthrow him. So, so Joab takes into his own hands the life of the king's son. And if you remember David, when David, David, his army won, what did he do? He mourned for a very, very long time over Absalom. And we saw it was too long. And then Joab came and encouraged him and said, you are making your, your whole nation turn against you. You need to stop and you need to go out there and encourage the people. And David did. And then we saw something kind of interesting in, in chapter 20. David waited for the people, I'm sorry, 19, we're in 20. David waited for the people to choose him to be the king. He didn't force that. He wanted to wait for the people to choose him to be their king 
before just riding back in and taking back over, which he rightfully could have done, absolutely. But in verses, specifically in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 19, we saw, um, we saw Israel really wavering. They were kind of waffling. They, they, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know if they should go back to David as their king. They were looking at this and they were, they were weighing it out. They were saying, David, we, his track record, he saved us from the Philistines. He's done good for us. But he also fled from the land because of Absalom. Um, and then Absalom died in battle. So now what do we do? Do we bring him back? And so they're in this place not really knowing, and that plays into our chapter that we're going to look at tonight. So they're just sort of in a mess. They don't know what to do. And David, it, during this time, sends to his tribe, Judah, you guys remember, saying, hey, you guys are my tribe. Why don't you come and bring me back as the king? Kind of be my, my escort my entourage or, or whatever it is. And so we reached out to them and they accepted the request. But in the process, David added in one of our main characters for the chapter tonight, Amasa. I don't know if you guys remember this guy. He made Amasa the commander of the armies of Israel. He was the captain of, or the commander of Absalom's troops. You guys remember that? And so he lost the battle for Absalom and David brings him in as the new commander over all the nation, of all the armies of Israel, which did something. It also put Joab out from being the commander. And David kind of gave him the boot. And most commentaries think that at this point, David realized, Joab killed my son. And he, it, the word came back and he was just mad at Joab. So he throws him out uh, of the whole scene here at that point, And then... From last week, David, he really just wrapped up some loose ends with a few people. You guys remember that scene? Some people that needed some attention. And then at the very end of the chapter, um, and kind of rolling into the beginning of this one, there was a quarrel between Israel and Judah over who got to escort the king back. Which is interesting, because Israel, they weren't even sure they wanted him to be their king. At the beginning of the chapter, now at the very end of the chapter, they want David to be the king, but they want to be the ones to bring him in. So they come up to Judah. Why are you the ones that get to do it? Well, and there's an argument, if you guys remember from last week, which the tribe of Judah won by getting louder and rowdier, basically, and making the guys of Israel leave. And we looked at that little note. I don't know if you guys remember that note. You might win the argument, but sometimes you'll lose the whole friendship when you do this kind of arguing uh, winning and proving and making, getting louder to be the one who's right. But anyways, so that's where we are. We're catching back up at the very end of that one section there. Um, it actually says he comes in to uh, Jerusalem, but we're going to see it again in ver at the beginning of uh, chapter 20, him coming in to Jerusalem. But that brings us, so the most relevant things that we want to bring or catch from that last section is number one, this waffling of Israel back and forth, not knowing what they wanted to do. And then also just keep in, in mind the, the dynamic of Joab being kicked out of the army and Amasa being in his place, because that's going to play into our story tonight, which is a completely crazy, I don't know if you read ahead, it's crazy. So we're going to go through a section of scripture, definitely, probably rated R. It's, it's a very descriptive, crazy thing that happens. So we're just going to look at it learn from it, glean what we can from it, praise God through it, and then pray. Amen? So chapter 20, verse 1. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Berchi, um, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have an inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. And so every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Birchi. Uh, the, but the men of Judah from the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. So right off the bat, we have Sheba. And I think he was already disgruntled because of his name. Life is sure hard for a boy named Sheba. Of course, that's, 
That's just a joke. It was probably not a, a girly, feminine kind of name. But I just, I, wasn't there like Princess Sheba or something? I don't know. Anyways, I just, Queen Sheba? Okay. So anyways, here's Sheba. He's already upset. But it says right there from the text, he was a rebel. So he's, he's coming in. He's not a good person. And what he does here is he takes advantage of this unrest, this divide in Israel. He's, he's the opposite of a peacemaker. He sees the situation. He doesn't think, I want to bring peace into this. He thinks, how can I take advantage of this to benefit myself? And so he starts this division here. And I, when I think of what Jesus said, though, about the peacemaker, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, children of God. And so here's, here's kind of the opposite. Here's kind of someone being a, a dissension causer, a division causer, a child really a tool of the enemy is what's going on here. So we, we have to kind of look at this situation, look at what's happening, and, and watch out for people that come into our lives looking to bring division, looking to, to, to be someone who's not a peacemaker, not a, someone who, who unites people. But watch out for people like this. And really quickly, this is a tactic of our enemy to bring division. It's one of those things that he does is to try to bring division. And, and so often when he can't defeat the church or whoever it is, the family from the outside, he wants to get inside and cause some kind of division from the inside. And that's what's happening here. Sheba is one of them. And he's coming in to cause division from the inside. And when I think about this scheme or tactic of the devil, I think it's because he knows this truth, probably because he was there and heard a great teacher say it, and it was in regards to Jesus doing miracles by the hand of the devil. You remember what Jesus said? A house divided cannot stand. And so here we have the enemy probably overhearing that and thinking, I need to get inside and divide this house so that it cannot stand. And, I, and of course, I'm not talking about back then. I'm saying this is what the enemy does in our lives. This is what he wants to do. You know, he wants to do it in cots. He wants to do it in a U-turn. He wants to do it in the church. Anywhere where there's people that are united in Christ, he wants to get in there and bring division. And so often it's by talking and bitterness and those kind of things that happen. And I just say, Lord, will you protect us and will you help us to be those upright people? Amen? We, we need to. We need to stand against those lies from the enemy and we need to walk in his truth. So here we have it. Sheba leading Israel. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Sheba's leading Israel. David and Amasa, that general or the captain of the army, are leading Judah. So verse 3. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and he put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. All of a sudden, random, probably. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember those gals. These, these were the, the David's ten concubines that he left at home to keep the house, which it mentions there. These are the ones that were basically, they were raped by Absalom, right? On the housetop at the guidance or direction of Ahithophel. And so here, here's these women and, and David. So we see in this scene, the first thing that we see in verse 3 is David's homecoming. He comes home. He comes back to where he's supposed to be, back to the place that God had called him to be on the throne in Israel. And then we see what he does with these concubines. He handles them by putting them, it says they're in seclusion, and supporting them. And of course, when you go through commentaries, they're all mixed on this. Some of them are going, man, they kind of applaud uh, David for taking care of these, these ladies into their widowhood and, you know, giving them a place to stay and providing for them um, and not just kicking them out. Um, and some of, them are, some of them fault David for doing this and, and say, man, why is he giving them this treatment and locking them out of his life, so to speak, and... I mean, we really don't know what this scene looked like, literally. 
We don't know where they were at. We don't know if they were... I mean, it almost sounds like to me when I just read it, like he locked them in a dungeon somewhere and gave them food the rest of their lives. I mean, that's literally what comes to my mind. That's like a prison sentence. He shut them up and fed them kind of thing. And we're not sure. I, personally, I don't think he did that. I think he was a little more honorable than that. Um, and I don't know if that's something that's super important that we need to ask him when we get there. But what we do know... <laughs> You know, when we get to heaven and go, anybody see David's con 10 concubines? I need to talk to them. <laughs> How are you? You know, what is going on? Uh, we can glean something. And, and when I look at this section of scripture, I go back to the truth. Either way you look at it, they wouldn't be in the position that they're in if David would have obeyed God's word. They wouldn't be locked up. They wouldn't be going through this pain if they would have stuck to what God's plan was for marriage. And David would have stuck to what God's word was to the kings, not to multiply wives. And this is even worse than multiplying wives because they're concubines, which means he gets the advantage of, you know, the intimacy part for, a, you know, a nice Old Testament to go into to these gals. But... They don't get to partake in the benefits. You know what it was especially sad for? Was the sons that were born of the concubines. They were actually heirs of the king, but got treated like servants. They didn't get the heritage of the king, like a son of a wife would. And so you look at the whole thing, and David, he missed it here. And of course, when you look back over the history of David's life, this is where he missed it. He missed it with Bathsheba, with multiplying wives, with the concubines, with so many things in his life, this was it. This was that hard place. And so if he, if he wouldn't have done what he did, they wouldn't, these women wouldn't have been wronged by David. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have been, had an opportunity to be wronged by Absalom. Then they wouldn't be being put away. And, and it's a sad truth, but it's the truth nonetheless because sin hurts people. I mean, it's something for us to take into consideration for ourselves, our sin. And I'm, I'll tell you this, even a sin that you think is a secret sin or is hidden, it hurts people. It definitely does. So we want to put that out of our lives. We're going to get an awesome picture how to do that. So let's keep, uh, let's keep moving on through the chapter. But before we hit that, I just want to say that if God's biblical plan had played out for their lives, they would have each been married to one guy had their own family, had their own household, their own provider, and that specifically is God's plan for our lives. That's what he reveals to us in his word. It doesn't always work out like a fairy tale ending, but that's his design, and it works best. And I can tell you from experience, it works best when we stick to his plan. It's a blessing. Okay, verse 4. And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and present here yourself, or um, be present here yourself. Verse 5. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now, Sheba, the son of Birchi, will do us more harm than Absalom. So take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men with the Cherethites, the Pileothites, and all the mighty men, those were the secret service guys that had David's back. Um, and in verse 7 there, specifically, take note of Joab's men, uh, and all the mighty men went out after him, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Birchi. So, we have this scene playing out. You guys remember really quickly, you remember who Abishai is? Abishai is Joab's brother, okay? And he's, he's another one of these men that's one of David's men that's, that's a leader, a mighty man of valor, leading, uh, leading the troops. And so, we kind of get this weird stuff. So, there's a couple of things. The first thing that I want to mention is this little section shows us what David thought or how maybe I should say how wise Ahithophel's um, advice was to David. Do you guys remember? I mean, not to David, to Absalom. If you guys remember that whole thing with Ahithophel and 
I can't remember the other guy's name with an H. He shy or something like that. Do you remember what happened? Ahithophel gave him sound advice. Go after David right now. Don't let him settle. Don't let him run. Don't let him flee. Go after him as soon as possible. And then he got the other advice that sounded better. And that was all God's plan. That was all part of God's doing. And so he didn't go directly after them right away before they got into a fortified place. That's the whole thing. David sees it. He didn't even think twice. He says like exactly what Ahithophel's plan was. He says, get out of there quickly. This is important that we get after uh, Sheba quickly because he can do more harm than Absalom if he gets out and finds this fortified city. So he gives Amasa three days, go do it. And Amasa delays. He, he, he delays and so, like I said, David sends Abishai. It, it took... It took too long for Amasa to gather together these troops. And we're going to see quickly, this is exactly what Sheba does. He goes straight for a fortified city, and, he, and they don't make it there in time. And the one little note that I want to give uh, to you guys is, one of the commentaries I went through said one of the reasons for Amasa's delay might have been because the men of David who were, according to our text right there, and I think I mentioned it as a note, in verse 7, they were actually Joab's men. A lot of these guys were loyal to Joab. And we're not exactly 100% sure, but we get a little insight into it. We get the sense that maybe Joab's men didn't respect Amasa one bit. They fought against him. And we get the sense that they, they just kind of drug their feet and didn't respond to his call to go to battle for David. And we'll see a little bit more insight um, into that a, a little bit more in the chapter. So verse 8. And when they were at a large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. And now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, his sword fell out. And then Joab said to Amasa, are you in health, my brother? Now, those two were cousins. So he says, are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand. And he struck him with it in the stomach. And his entrails poured out on the ground. And he did not strike him again. So he let him remain alive in that state. And thus, he died. And so... We get this crazy scene. One of the first things that I want you to know from this scene, never let another man grab your beard to kiss you. All right? This is something I have a rule I've lived by ever since. <laughs> man, so Joab, he kills Amasa. And, a, and really, a, I mean, you can see the scene play out in your mind. It was tricky how he did it. It was pretty crafty. He let the sword fall out and then acted like, oh, it was no big deal. So that when he got close, he had the sword out and in his hand. And when he went to kiss his brother, he was able to stab him in the stomach, unknowing. And so we, we see a couple of things, man. What, what a craziness. What a, oh, what, a, what a gross, what a horrible way um, to die there. And then... Let's see, did I read the, the last, very end of verse 10? Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Birchi. So after he kills him, it's, it, we're going to see a little bit more, uh, that he kind of stays and remains there, wallowing in his blood in just a second. But he, after, after Joab does this, his son and himself, man, they take, or his son, his brother and him, take off instantly to go and get uh, Sheba. So they're just on a mission, and we kind of, one of the things we kind of see here is even though Joab's tricky, he's so loyal to David still. He goes right after this guy. So what he basically does is take his position back in a horrible way that he should be, definitely be in trouble for. Let me, let me just tell you, you guys, we know the Old Testament, the, the, the crime of murder was death. The punishment was death. It was wrong for him to do this, but he does it, and he takes off. Um, to go get Sheba. So man, Joab is a character. It's a total character. He's a guy, I don't know. You kind of like to have him on your side, but you still got to watch your back because you never know what's going to happen, especially if he's going to grab your beard and kiss you. 
So, but moving on to this next section, um, this is the next section that can give us a little insight into that thought that maybe the men didn't want to fight under, jo- under um, Amasa, but under Joab, and were loyal to him. So verse 11, it says, Meanwhile, one of Joab's men, so we got a guy of Joab, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa, and, and he said, he like yelled out, Whoever favors Joab, and whoever is for David, follow Joab. So he kind of does a rally cry to the rest of the troops. Hey, if you're for David, follow after Joab. Verse 12, but Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, so the guy that's hollering out, follow Joab if you're for David, he sees all these people, they're standing there still. And what we get from this is that they're just looking at this horrible mess in the middle of the road. And so he moved, this guy moves Amasa away from the highway to the field and threw a a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. And when he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Birchi. So really, I mean, the, the the, the most thing I think we could liken that to is if you were ever on the highway and there's been an accident, everybody slows down to look. I mean, and it causes problems. And so here's what's happening. This guy's sitting here dying, and everyone stops to look and see what's going on. And I don't know who this guy is, this no-name guy, but he takes the initiative to say, hey, we got to get this party moving. So the man covered him and took off, verse 11. So So the people, in verse 11, sorry, the people followed Joab, and there, here we are. So after kind of hearing that rally cry and the, seeing that the people are going after Joab, it could kind of lean into this is the one who they wanted to follow. They never wanted to follow Amasa. But whoever, whoever this guy was following uh, David, who was for David and Joab, we think that those people were going right after him. So verse 14, And then he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and Beth Makkah and the and the the Beerites and, and and I would have to believe that in verse fourteen it's either the man or I, and I think probably Joab. So Joab takes off and he rallies people from Israel who will come and fight with him. So he goes to these tribes of Israel um, and it says there in verse fourteen. So they were gathered together and also all went after Sheba. Verse fifteen. So they came and besieged him in Abel of. Beth uh, Makkah. So the city is called Abel. And they cast up a siege mound against the city and stood by the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So we have this scene. They set up a siege mount, like a battle mount. So, I mean, the idea is that they built something up to where the gate was. We're not sure if there was some kind of, I don't know exactly what it was in there. We'll have to play this one back when we see it. But this would be an interesting one to play back for reasons to come. But they built a siege mount. And if you, I don't know if you guys, you know, back in those days, you could literally siege a city for years. And one of the main things they would do in a siege is they would stop the water supply and any of the trade or food supplies into the city. And so they'd stop that stuff. And a lot of times it was just a waiting game to starve them out. And so here we have this siege, but we also have Joab being a lot more aggressive. He builds them out and he's like, I'm going to knock this wall down because we're going to stop this rebellion against David. So, man, we see Joab being a man. He's just, he means business. And he's just battering this wall to throw it down, which in his doing, he gets the attention of a wise woman from the city in verse 16. And then a wise woman cried out from the city, here, here, please say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. And when he had come near to her, the woman said, are you Joab? And he answered, I am. I don't know why, but I always hear like John Wayne right there, you know, (laughs) or maybe Clint Eastwood. But for me, it's John Wayne. And then he said to him, she said to him, hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I'm listening. Verse 16, and he, or verse 18, and he, she spoke saying, 
They used to talk in former times saying, they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? So she speaks wisdom to him. And she says, look, this city is a place of peace. It's a place that solves disputes. There's wise people that live here. And I think she was including herself. I am one of these mothers. Why are you going to cause all this destruction against the inheritance of the Lord? One thing I like about this lady, she knows whose she is. I am one of the kids of God. If you destroy this city, you're destroying Israel. Israel is the place that God has given to us. It's the inheritance. It's the land, and you're going to destroy the inheritance of the Lord. So she is wise in what she says. Verse 20, and Joab answered and and said, Far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so. But a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Birchi by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, Watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. Right? And Joab, at that point, said, Hey, can I get your number, girl? What's up? He probably, there was a sun shining and birds chirping. And a woman after his own heart. You know, I just spilled some guy's intestines on the road earlier. Would you throw me that head? Man. You're so beautiful. Anyways. But what a bold, awesome thing. I'm sorry. It's crazy, but it's, it is. Watch, his head will be thrown to you from over the wall. So then the woman in her wisdom went into the people and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Birchi, and threw it out to Joab. Heads up. (laughs) Sorry. I had to, sorry. And then Joab blew the trumpet and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. Right? So, man, what a crazy chapter. I'm telling you, absolutely crazy. Actually, I mean, and obviously I have written in my notes here in my mind, this is comical, but it's still, it's not that funny. Uh, <laughs> but this woman, she does have wisdom. And, you know, I don't know, I kind of would have liked to see the speech of her going back to the people, the, the elders of the city and saying, hey, look, we got to get, it's better for this one man to be gone than for our whole city to perish. And they obviously agreed. And, right? And then the heads were flying over the wall. So she tossed that head out, which in itself would have been totally crazy. I don't want to see that. I want to see a depiction of it on a movie. There's the picture. No! Man. That's like a for free throw line. Foosh. So... So, but, but out of all of this crazy wild picture, we get, we get something pretty awesome out of this. Because if Sheba is the picture of the sin of division and letting bitterness in, or just sin in general, she's quick to chop it off. She's quick to judge the sinfulness of it and get it out of her village, out of her house, out of her town. She's a, wo- a woman of wisdom. And shows us an amazing picture of how to deal with sin. Not to let it remain. Not to shelter it. Not to let it rationalize its way or talk its way into staying in our lives. But to deal with it quickly and with exacting judgment, right? She hit the mark, for sure. And I think she understood. If I let the sin remain, it will take me out. It will take my family out, my people. It's just some good, good sound advice that we get from looking at this passage. She would not let the sin remain. And she cut its head off and threw it over the wall. So in verse 23, and Joab was over all the army of Israel. So, and there's, there's the note. This is where we're headed into. Joab, he's back. He's the commander again. And it's one of those things. I mean, he's definitely unorthodox. 
He's definitely proven his loyalty to David. And David, after this, it seems, just allows, allows him to stay and be over the army of Israel. And then he goes in and he, and he just, this section right here just shows us again, the people that David is kept in government, kept in offices uh, around him. Uh, Benaiah, the son of uh, Je- Jehodiah, was over the Cherethites and the Peleothites. That's the secret service. Um, Adoram was in charge of the revenue. So now he's in charge of the taxes. And first time we kind of see David having somebody over the money and the taxes and those things. But if you remember when the children of Israel were like, no, we want a king. We want a king. God told them he's going to tax you. He's going to take your kids as his servants. It's going to be hard. And so I mean, we just see the prophecy and the fulfillment of what God says coming to pass here. Jehoshaphat, the son of uh, Ahilad, was the recorder. 25, Shiva was a scribe. Zadok and Ebiathar were the priests. And verse 26, and Ira, the Jerethite, was the chief minister under David. So we have Ira, the Jerethite, The chief, so the king had a chief minister. And some of the commentaries I went through said that the chief minister would kind of be like the chaplain. It was kind of like the chief minister would be David's own personal minister. His advisor, his godly advisor in his life. And so here we have David kind of in his older, he's getting older, he's in his older age, especially in that day and age, for someone to live mid-60s in that day and age. That was a really awesome thing for them. So here he is, he's in this time in his life, and it kind of comes to a conclusion that we haven't seen before. I need a godly person in my life to say, hey, how are you doing today with the Lord? How are you? And this is David, this is the king. He didn't need to have this in his life. He wanted this in his life. This is also David the king who's known for being a man after what? God's own heart. Man, no, to me when I look at this, this is one of the ways he proves it. He says, I want to have somebody with me that can hold me accountable. That can call me out. And I'm just saying, we need this in our lives. We need this in our lives. We need to be this for someone, and we need to have someone like this in our lives as well. It's really, I mean, when I think of this, I think it's really, all it is is very grassroots discipleship. It's just somebody to hold you accountable, to walk through life with, to encourage you in the word. But that is important to have someone in your life that says, how are you doing spiritually? When's the last time you read your Bible? I mean, sometimes you don't want to hear that. You're like, oh, a few days ago. Hey, well, hey, no judgment here, but get in the word. It's what we need, right? It's a guide to our path and just to have those people in our lives. And I think if David needs it, oh, do we need it. Amen? May we take steps to be a real family in our church, in our little body here, caring for one another, calling each other out. So, and thus ends the crazy chapter, chapter 20, uh, of our scripture in Second Samuel, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more for us in store. But I wanted to, like I said earlier, I don't know if Caleb, Caleb's here. All right, I'm gonna have Caleb come up, and we're gonna we're gonna sing a couple of songs here in a moment. But I just wanted to take some time, and if you guys would just stand with me for a moment, I wanted to take a few minutes, not not a whole long time, but just a few minutes to bring our hearts to a place of, you know, a sincerity before the Lord and to a place of prayer before the Lord and to get our hearts in a place where we are knit together with one heart before God and and having a couple of thoughts in our mind. The first one I already mentioned is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verse 17, when Jesus taught them saying, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And I, I quoted from the Gospel of Mark because there's three more words in there that are in Isaiah. It says, for all nations. And it's that, he's quoting from Isaiah when God is saying, I'm going to bring the Gentiles in. And they're going to be in my people. They're going to want to honor me with their lives. They're going to want to listen to my word. And my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. But you know what? Let's take that in a little bit of a different approach. And let's say 
We're going to pray for our nation tonight. This house, the Lord's house, we're a house of all different brothers and sisters from all different walks and places in life. But we have one thing in common. We've been saved by an amazing God. And a God that calls us to prayer. It calls us to prayer for the healing of our land. And we're going to pray for the healing of Israel as well, for, the, for his land. But we want to pray for our nation and, and, and just kind of take literally here Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I will heal and I will forgive their sins, which is primarily what we need in our nation. And then I will hear their land. There's a progression to this whole thing. But the first thing is that the people that are called by his name. And I know in the Old Testament, that's Israel. And I know for us, that's me. And that's you. We're the people of Jesus. We're the weird Jesus people. And proud to be. Jesus. Thankful that he's bought us and purchased us and the world may think the cross is stupid or foolishness but it's life for us it's our everything and so we that are called by his name number one humble ourselves humble ourselves and man when we look at the world today when we look at social media or whatever everyone's got their own piece of wisdom that they think is better than everyone else forget all that Humble ourselves before God. I don't have the answer, but I know the one who does. I'm not going to tell you what my answer is, but I'm going to plead to the one who hears our prayers. I want his answer. I want his will for this world. We need to be praying his will. I know so many times we want to pray for a healing and a booming economy. I think that's a selfish prayer. I want to pray for his will, and I want to pray that people will get saved. Money's not the answer. The bed you're sleeping on is not the answer. The roof over your head is not the answer. If all those are stripped away, Jesus, and I think of the words, I believe it's Corey Tim Boom, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And I'm here to testify, and I think all of us, he's all we need. He's all we need. So let's bow our hearts before the Lord. And God, we come before you and we humble ourselves. I'm going to get down on my knees. If you want to come up here or just get on your knees where you're at, go ahead. But God, I humble myself before you. God, our nation's broken, Lord. And we cry out to you, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We, we plead in, on behalf of just our whole nation, God. We, we cry out for law enforcement, Lord. And we cry out for those that are being beaten and abused, Lord. And in the sake of justice, and Lord, the whole thing is it's kind of nonsense, Lord. There's so much injustice happening. There's so much evil being called good and good being called evil. We know you're coming soon and we ask for your will. But we pray that you protect people and that you'd save lives, God. We cry out, Lord. We cry out with, with hundreds and thousands of other Christians tonight that are praying the same thing. God, we plead. We plead the shed blood of Jesus over our nation and God, over those that are suffering and that are hurting, God. Lord, we pray over the family of the man who was killed by the officer, Lord. We ask you to protect him and be with him, God. Lord, give him your grace. Show him your love and your mercy. And God, we cry out for your hand to move, Lord, in a mighty way. And we thank you that you, God, you're the faithful one. Lord, we're thankful we don't pray to idols or... To nothings we pray to the one true and living God. He who is able. And Lord, you've done so much. You've, you've done everything we need. You've taken our sin, Lord, but we're just crying out. God, protect the police officers, the firefighters, 
God, protect the business owners. Lord, we're just asking for your hand and for you to move in a mighty way. God, we humble ourselves before you and we cry out to the God who can. Lord, we thank you tonight for this moment where we can come together before you with one heart, all because of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask you to move in our midst. We ask you to heal what's broken. But more than anything, Lord, may your light shine in our world, in our lives. Lord, may we lead people to you in the truth of your love. So we pray these things tonight in the mighty, awesome, wonderful name of Jesus. And all God's children said, amen. 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 So we're gonna we're gonna sing let's sing a song and then uh, we're gonna sing another one afterwards. But after this first song, uh, we'll we'll release you guys. But thank you so much for this time, Lord. Thank you for this family that we have, God. Thank you for the prayers that you hear our prayers. How awesome it is, Lord, to cry out to you on behalf of our loved ones and our nation. Thank you, God. You are good. You are good when there's nothing good in me. You are loved. You are loved on display for all to see. You are light. You are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope. You are hope. You have covered all our sin. You are peace. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death is lost its deep. Oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reigns. You are more, you are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I made whole. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name jesus jesus 
And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won, for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. I know the night. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within you I will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you never fail. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I've seen you move the mountains and I believe I see you do it again you made a way when there was no way and I believe I see you do it again I've seen you move you move the mountains and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way when there was no 
way and I believe I see you do it again 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 Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. Thank you, God. Thank you. Lord, it's true, your, your faithfulness is unending, God. It's unmatched, Lord. And we're so thankful for that hope that we have. God, we pray that you'd, you'd continue to reveal that hope and that truth to us, Lord, even in the passing of life, Lord, even as our sister Sherry has, has passed from this life, you have not failed. Your promise still stands. And she is with you. God, even in our hardships and our trials, you have not failed, Lord. You're faithful. You're the most faithful being ever. And we thank you that we can trust you, God. Lord, we pray a covering over our brother Dave tonight, Lord. Give him your peace that passes understanding. May your presence be strong, Lord. God, we just continue to lift up and pray over our nation, over our sick loved ones, over our lost loved ones. Bring them to Jesus, Lord. Bring them to that understanding, Lord. Open their eyes. God, your word says that they're blinded by the things in this world, the philosophies of this age, and all these demonic, ungodly things. Open their eyes. Let them see your love clearly, the perfect Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So we thank you tonight for this time, Lord. We thank you for this family that we have called Calvary Payson here, Lord. We're blessed. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the presence of your spirit. And God, tonight we're thankful that you hear the prayers and the cries of the people that are called by your name. Lord, we won't stop. We will continue to cry out for you. Even so, Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name and all God's children said, Amen. 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 Amen.